Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about the deep neck flexors. This is a group of four very small muscles on the anterior surface of the cervical vertebrae. In fact, you have to peel off all other layers to get to these four muscles. So this is the deepest layer of muscles in the anterior neck. And the four muscles, of which we'll go into more detail in a few minutes, are rectus capitis anterior, rectus capitis lateralis, longus capitis, and then longus colli, also called longus cervicus. In some sources you'll see that, but the most common name is longus colli. Now there's really two major functions of this muscle group, and those are number one, cervical retraction, and number two, maintenance of good cervical posture. We covered cervical protraction and retraction in one of the previous videos. And when we talked about these, we divided the cervical spine into an upper cervical spine and a lower cervical spine. The upper is the smaller part, and it really just consists of the atlantal occipital joint between the occiput and C1, or the atlas, and the atlantal axial joint between C1 and C2, the axis. Every other joint within the cervical spine, all these down here, would be the lower cervical spine. And so when we talk about cervical retraction in particular, we're talking about flexion of the upper cervical spine. It turns out the lower cervical spine is actually going into extension here, but the deep neck flexors perform flexion specifically of the upper cervical spine. Now in terms of maintaining good cervical posture, over here on the right, retraction, you'll never see anybody just walking around like this. This would be active contraction of these deep neck flexors. But then in protraction over here on the left, this is arguably bad cervical posture. And so good posture is probably somewhere in between protraction and retraction. Now, an important note, the deep neck flexors are actually very weak muscles. They are endurance muscles. So rather than exerting a large force and having strength, they're really just designed to be able to contract a really small amount of force for a very long period of time. They're endurance muscles. So if you're between protraction and retraction, somewhere in the middle for good posture, those deep neck flexors are going to be contracted to a small extent, but for a long period of time to hold that in position. If you were chronically postured in cervical protraction like this, well then those deep neck flexors aren't working. And so they're actually going to become weak. On the flip side, the muscles here on the back of the upper cervical spine, which are actually the suboccipital muscles, we'll be covering those in a future video, they actually become tight and can become a pain generator. But with chronic posturing and protraction, those deep neck flexors right here actually become weak. And so if you have somebody that's chronically postured like this, their deep neck flexors will be weak. And so one of the things you should help them with is learn how to contract their deep neck flexors, strengthen them in an endurance manner, go into active retraction like this, flex that upper cervical spine, and then that can help them attain a posture between protraction and retraction and potentially get rid of some pain, which would most likely actually be coming from the suboccipitals, again, a future video. Where you might actually see this posturing is actually in upper cross syndrome like this, which spans more than just the neck, but also involves the trapezius, the levator scapulae, the pectorals, and a bunch of other muscles. But upper cross syndrome is where you might actually see this protracted cervical posturing. Now an important note about the deep neck flexors. This is where they're roughly located between the occiput C1 and C2. They overall are extremely, extremely weak in terms of overall cervical flexion. When you test overall cervical flexion, let's say in a clinic, you're asking the person to bend their entire neck forward and basically try to touch the tip of their mandible to their sternum. That's cervical flexion. If we're talking about that movement, that's going to be more sternocleidomastoid, maybe some other muscles like the scalenes. Okay? If we're talking about cervical rotation or lateral flexion, also called side bending, we're considering sternocleidomastoid, even the splenius muscles here, and the upper traps. These muscles overall are just weak flexors of the upper cervical spine. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. 
let's talk about the first one, rectus capitis anterior. So just so you know what we're looking at here, okay, right here is actually the base of the occiput. This is the occipital bone right here. Okay? So this bone right here, this is actually the anterior surface of the atlas, C1. This right here would be C2, C3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this would actually be T1, T2, and T3. And you can even see coming off of T1, we've got the first ribs right there. Okay, so we're looking at an anterior view, which is where those deep neck flexors are. Over here, we have rectus capitis anterior. That's this muscle right here. It's going to originate off of the lateral mass of C1, the atlas. So right here's the atlas. Here's its lateral mass. You can see that coming off of that. And it extends up to the basilar part of the occipital bone, or occiput, right there. That's a pretty small muscle. Now its action is atlano-occipital flexion. Remember that the upper cervical spine is just the atlano-occipital joint and the atlano-axial joint. Now seeing as the atlano-axial joint really only does rotation, this muscle is only gonna participate in some weak flexion of the atlano-occipital joint. Okay? Its innervation is through ventral rami because this is an anterior muscle and it's gonna be the C1 and C2 ventral rami and its blood supply is via the ascending artery. Okay. Then we have rectus capitis lateralis right here that goes vertically as opposed to the diagonal rectus capitis anterior. Rectus capitis lateralis is the weakest of all four of these deep neck flexors. They're already all weak. This is the weakest. Okay. It's going to extend inferiorly from its origin at the transverse process of C1 right here. It's going to go up and attach on the jugular process of the occipital bone. Now, the action of rectus capitis lateralis is to perform atlano-occipital side bending. That's what some sources will say. And that's basically where you just take your neck and bend one ear to touch the shoulder on the same side. So bending your neck to the side. It does so, of course, only at the atlano-occipital joint. But this is a really small, weak muscle, and it has a high concentration of muscle spindles. So some other sources will say it's actually less of a contractile structure and really more of a proprioceptive structure. So letting your brain know where your neck is in space, depending on how much you're side bending to a given side or rotating. Okay? Um, and other sources will say that it really just plays a role more in stabilization. Even when you're going into active cervical retraction, um, it does less of the contraction and more just stabilizing in that particular position. Okay, preventing you from going into excessive protraction. But this is the weakest of all four of these muscles. Innervation is the same as it was for rectus capitis anterior, which makes sense. It's about at the same level. So it's the C1 and C2 ventral rami. And the blood supply is actually threefold, which kind of is weird given how small the muscle is, but it's vertebral artery, occipital artery, and the ascending pharyngeal artery. Okay. The third muscle is longus capitis. Now the two longest muscles are of course a lot longer. Uh, this is actually a little bit shorter than longus colli. Okay, here's longus capitis. Now longus capitis is gonna originate off of the transverse processes of C3 through C6. Okay? And specifically on those transverse processes, these little bumps called anterior tubercles. Okay? So right here we see C1, C2, C3. Okay? So it's gonna originate kind of over there and then from C4, and then down on C5. Then those fibers come up, and they're actually gonna insert up here on the basilar part of the occipital bone. If you actually look on the patient's left side over here, notice that their longus capitis has actually been cut to reveal the underlying rectus capitis anterior. So in terms of the insertion up here, you'll actually notice that the longus capitis uh, lies superficial to or anterior to, at least part of this rectus capitis anterior. Okay. And the innervation is from ventral rami of C1 to C3, or sometimes there's a contribution from C4 as well. Okay. Now the action of this muscle is going to be atlano-occipital flexion. Okay. Even though it originates a little bit further down than these two rectus capitis muscles, it still is inserting on the occipital bone, and so it's going to be able to produce flexion mainly at that atlano-occipital joint. It's also going to be able to participate in a little bit of ipsilateral rotation, more stabilizing in a rotation position. Okay? If you're thinking about gross rotation of the neck, again, we're thinking more sternocleidomastoid, upper traps, maybe even some of the splenius muscles, depending. 
but this is more of a stabilization muscle. It's not playing a very big role in, ro in rotation by any means. But again, because this muscle is involved in atlanto-occipital flexion, it can participate in cervical retraction, flexion of that upper cervical spine. And the blood supply is via the ascending cervical artery, and the lower parts of the muscle get some from the inferior thyroid artery. Now the last of these four deep neck flexors is the most complicated of all of them because it has three parts. This is called longus colli, sometimes called longus cervicus. Sometimes in the neck you'll see these terms capitus and cervicus. So capitus implies that it inserts all the way up on the skull. Doesn't matter where on the skull, just somewhere on the skull. And if you look at all three of these first muscles, they all insert on the occipital bone, right? So that's why they get the term capitus. In other sources, you'll see longus cervicus. Cervicus implies a neck muscle that doesn't quite go up to the skull. It may go up to the atlas, it may go up to the axis, but it does not go to the skull. So some sources will call it longus cervicus, but most will call it longus colli. Okay? Now the longus colli has three parts. Some will just say superior, intermediate, or inferior. Here you see superior oblique, that's the superior because some of these fibers are going at a slight diagonal. The vertical part is the intermediate part, and then the inferior oblique is the inferior over here. So three different parts of these. Now if we look at the superior part first, it's going to originate on the anterior tubercles of those transverse processes, we mentioned those before, of C3 through C5. So again, C1, C2, C3. We see one of those origins right here, another one here at C4, and another one here at C5. Those fibers kind of go up right here, and they're going to insert on the anterior tubercle of C1. Now, the transverse processes on most of these levels have anterior and posterior tubercles. But remember, the atlas C1 is a special vertebra. Uh, it has different parts. And so the anterior tubercle is actually all the way out here in front, kind of in front of the vertebral body. Okay, so it's a different anterior tubercle. But that's where the superior oblique part inserts. Now, if we look at the intermediate part, it has origins really on the vertebral bodies from C5 down to T3. So here's C1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is where they start, about right in here. C6, C7, T1, T2, and T3. Okay. And those fibers run up, and they insert on the anterior surface of the bodies of vertebrae C2 through C4. So all the way up to here, C2, about right there about right here on C3, and then here on C4. Okay, so that's the vertical part. Now the inferior oblique part, or just inferior part, looks awfully similar to the intermediate part. If you look at the origins, they're also originating off of the anterior surface of vertebral bodies. Uh, they're slightly lower for the inferior part, so an intermediate C5 to T3, inferior is T1 to T3. The difference is where they insert. Okay, that's how you differentiate the fibers. The intermediate ones, or vertical ones, they insert on anterior vertebral bodies, whereas the inferior oblique ones insert on those anterior tubercles of transverse processes. Okay, So right around here, this might actually be considered a blending, really, of the intermediate and the inferior oblique parts. But again, you'd have the origins on T1, T2, and T3 vertebral bodies. You can see those there. But then, as they go up, they actually insert on the anterior tubercles of C5 and C6. So one, two, three, four, five. You can see it kind of going over here and a little bit over here on C6 as they come up, okay? Now one thing you'll notice here about longus colli is that it does not insert on the occiput. That's why it doesn't have the name capitis. So that being said, can this actually produce any flexion at the atlanto-occipital joint? And the answer is no. Longus colli does not exert any flexion at the atlanto-occipital joint. Rather, this produces a little bit of weak neck flexion at really all the other segments with really the exception of the atlanto-axial joint because there's really not a lot of flexion allowed there. It's really mostly rotational. Uh, but every one of the other segments down the cervical spine and even into the T-spine now again, this is extremely weak flexion, nothing compared to sternocleidomastoid, okay? But it does participate in just a little bit of that cervical flexion. Also, contralateral rotation and ipsilateral side bending.
Now, longus coli is innervated by ventral rami from C2 down through C6, and it gets its blood from the ascending pharyngeal artery and the vertebral artery. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.